This is EHJ Today at the Cardiology Update in Davos, Switzerland. And I'm Tom Lüscher, Editor-in-Chief of the European Heart Journal. And I have the pleasure to talk to Robert Giuliano, his Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the uh, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Welcome, Robert. Thanks for having me. So we're going to discuss the novel or anti oral anticoagulants that are not that novel, the NOACs. And uh, so why did we need them? What was, what was the medical need to develop them? Well, it was uh, recognized that the vitamin K antagonists, of which warfarin is used predominantly in the States, although certainly in Europe other variants are available and favored, uh, had certain limitations, although very effective and uh, anticoagulant are uh, somewhat challenging to use in practice uh, with multiple drug-drug and food-drug interactions, the need for monitoring because of some unpredictable uh, interpatient variability, um, and uh, a very narrow therapeutic index. There was a desire then to develop uh, newer oral anticoagulants that would be easier to use as effective, possibly even safer, and I, I think uh, several companies were successful with that. So what's the advantage of the current four major molecules that we have available in most countries? On a practical uh, side, uh, these are much easier drugs to use. Um, generally, if you know a few of the patient's uh, characteristics, uh, focusing mostly on, on renal function, uh, age, and body weight, you, you can select the dose. Um, there's uh, more than one dose for each of these agents, depending on uh, certain characteristics. Uh, but then that's it. There's no need for routine monitoring of anticoagulant effect. You should monitor the renal function periodically. Uh, there's a uh, much fewer number of drug-drug interactions. These uh, compounds don't tend to interact with food, uh, rivaroxaban being the one you should take with food. Just much easier to use. And then on, a, on the clinical side, looking at the safety profile, uh, each of the four NOACs that have been studied reduce intracranial bleeding by 50%, and that's their real clinical advantage. On, on, on the efficacy side, they're at least as good as warfarin, if not slightly better. This uh, intracranial bleedings are rare, but they're very severe side effects, usually leading to death or, or major problems for the patient, right? Exactly, and I think the most feared side effect of yeah. an anticoagulant. Right, right. right. And uh, so there are four molecules. Are there any difference or do you think it's more or less doesn't matter really which one to choose i mean they, they also inhibit different uh, proteins of the coagulation cascade and is this of any importance yeah well a, a good question an important one i'm definitely in the splitter category here i i think that i feel strongly there are important differences and it behooves the clinician to understand that these drugs aren't all the same um, you mentioned one of the differences, the target of action. Uh, curiously, that hasn't really uh, been a prominent feature in distinguishing uh, the, the, the clinical data between the agents. Dabigatran is, of course, a factor 2A inhibitor. The other three, uh, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and doxaban, inhibit factor 10A. And uh, there have been a lot of theor theoretical arguments about which is a better target to inhibit. It seems like we can uh, provide effective and safe anticoagulation inhibiting either target. Uh, but there are important differences amongst the drugs in other factors. Um, For uh, instance? A degree of, of renal uh, clearance, mm -hmm. which is about 80% mm -hmm. with dabigatran at one end and only 27% with apixaban. So mm -hmm. the need to adjust based on renal function is, is critical for dabigatran and arguably less important for apixaban. In practice, this is actually an important issue because uh, quite a substantial number of cardiovascular patients have impaired renal function, haven't they? Yes, sure, and with the aging of the population, we think that will grow. Right. Any other important difference? Yeah, there are important differences in how drugs are, the drugs are metabolized yes. and which of the few drug-drug interactions do exist. For example, uh, adoxaban and dabigatran have very little, if any, metabolism by the cytochrome P450 yes. pathway, so um, you don't have to worry about drugs that are potent SIP inhibitors with those two agents where with rivaroxaban and apixaban, depending on which the drug and renal function you may need to 
dose adjust. So for instance, in HIV treated patients or transplanted patients, it may be wiser to use edoxaban and, uh, and dapicotran. One will predict less of an, an interaction, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so what, the efficacy you said is more or less the same, or are there also differences in efficacy? Yeah, well, that's a good question, and it, it gets a little complicated depending on you know, what disease state you're treating. Um, atrial fibrillation, which is a field that I've mostly focused on, mm -hmm. um, I would say that each of the drugs are at least as good as warfarin mm -hmm. um, in preventing stroke and systemic embolism. If you parse the data more finely, I think, um, and it's hard because we don't have head-to-head -head comparisons, yeah, that's right. but dabigatran at the higher dose, the 150 BID, had the most favorable hazard ratio mm -hmm. against warfarin for ischemic stroke. Mm -hmm. So maybe a patient at very high risk of ischemic stroke, not mm -hmm. such a high risk of bleeding, I might lean that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the safety side, you know, we see uh, that the apixaban was, was quite safe. Uh, as was uh, lower doses of adoxaban. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., there is also a, a very low dose of the dapigatran, if I remember yeah. well, 75 milligrams. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is that uh, yeah. a couple targeted for? Yeah, a couple interesting uh, uh, points about that. Well, the FDA is uh, a very strong believer in a pharmacokinetic yes. uh, analyses. Because there was no outcome data with 75 eh? No data, not studied, and yet was approved for patients with creatinine clearance between 15 and 30 mm -hmm. mLs per minute, mm -hmm. uh, the 75 milligrams BIT. Now, the interesting thing is in some recent uh, unpublished data, I, think, I, I believe from marketing surveys, uh, nearly half the prescriptions in the U.S. are for 75 milligrams BID because physicians often choose a safer or lower dose. They're afraid to, of yeah. bleeding. Right. Yeah. An error of uh, commission, right, right, causing bleeding by giving a drug may be worse than an error of right. omission, right. although yeah, yeah. that's debatable. Uh, now let's talk about the different indications. Basically, yeah. Uh, thromboembolism has been yeah. studied, yeah. atrial fibrillation, and acute coronary syndromes. Right. Are, are there any differences between the no yeah. different NOACs uh, in these di three different indications? Yeah. yeah. Well, I would say that uh, for uh, acute coronary syndrome, there's really only one drug that be has been well studied and, and successfully so, and that would be rivaroxaban right. at, a, at doses that are much lower than That's are used right. for atrial fibrillation yes. or VTE. These were two times 2.5 and 5 milligrams, really very low dose. Very low dose, you know, either a quarter or half the standard yes. dose. Mm -hmm and as I understand is improved for use in, in, in selected European countries yes, in, in ACS, yes. uh, not, not approved by the US FDA. Mm -hmm. um, so for ACS patients, I think you really have only one choice if yes. you do have any amongst the NOACs that are approved. In VTE, we now have all four approved mm -hmm. for use in the US and we're expecting to hear soon from the European regulatory authorities about adoxaban. Um, any differences between the four in this indication? Well, again, we don't have the head-to-head -head data, mm -hmm. so that makes it challenging. Um, you know, apixaban was very safe uh, in their studies in VTE treatment, but I think all of the drugs showed uh, efficacy, at least as good as warfarin, certainly non-inferior, mm -hmm. um, much easier to use, and the safety profile is as good as, if not better, than warfarin. Um, and then uh, each of the four have also been studied in, in VTE prevention, um, somewhat less data with adoxaban, but these drugs are effective as well to prevent uh, VTE after major orthopedic surgery. And what about uh, in pulmonary embolism? In pulmonary embolism, I, I looked a little more in depth into this topic for this meeting here in Davos. Um, the best study drug, I would say, here is rivaroxaban. There was a dedicated study right. in pulmonary embolism called Einstein PE, so for a large number of patients well studied, uh, rivaroxaban was effective and, and safe. Um, but each of the other drugs in their trials of VTE enroll patients with pulmonary embolism, slightly less than half, and the uh, efficacy and safety profile were similar to the overall trial population. So the numbers aren't as large, but I have no reason to believe they're not as effective. 
And they recommend higher dosages in pulmonary embolism, right? Yeah, initially in mm -hmm. treatment of VTE, the doses are, uh, first couple of weeks, yeah, yeah. are, are higher for the first week or so. That wasn't the case with adoxaban. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly, uh, there were very promising results with adoxaban in high-risk pulmonary embolism. I, I don't know that the other uh, trials looked at this specifically, but amongst patients with right ventricular strain or elevated yeah. biomarkers, elevated right. BNP, adoxaban uh, was uh, significantly more effective than... Uh, it was 60 milligrams? Or? 60 milligram dose yeah. there, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so what is the perspective for, uh, for uh, acute coronary syndromes? Do you think this is going to be pursued further? Yeah. Because there was always this bleeding yeah. issue. Huh? Right. Well, it's a, it's a challenging area, right, because we also have a novel oral antiplatelet drugs and we're using two. And uh, with Vorapaxar, some might say there's yet another mm -hmm. oral antiplatelet drug that ought to be considered. And so I think, uh, I think that there's a possible role in selected patients, but I don't see a very large uh, number of ACS patients uh, 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 benefiting or uh, with the addition of oral anticoagulation in the setting of so many antiplatelets. I think there are some patients we could identify. Of course, then that, that begs the question of what happens if you have a patient with both atrial fibrillation or a recent uh, VTE event and ACS, and, and that, that is a wide open area. So that's for the next interview. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, coming to our studio. Yes, thank you for inviting me.